Good afternoon and welcome to the rebooted enlightening lunchless lunch from the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Uh, it's hard for me to see on this screen who all is uh, in the virtual world. There are several of us here in the real world. I'm Dave Gustin. I am no longer the director of the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, but still bringing you the enlightening lunches. It is my pleasure today to introduce Eusebio Scornavaca, who is one of our new faculty. And in fact, the theme of the Enlightening Lunches this semester will be introducing uh, a great host of new faculty that we have for you. Uh, Eusebio will be talking about climate change and digital entrepreneurship. Format still very much the same, except for the lack of pizza or uh, tacos or heroes or whatever else we would be ser uh, serving. Um, about 20, 20, about 25, 30 minutes from Eusebio, then general uh, Q&A for the remainder of the hour. And if the doctoral students are still around, uh, a few minutes after that to give them special attention from uh, Eusebio. Uh, as a reminder, our next enlightening lunch will be the 20th of October with uh, Danae Hernandez-Cortez uh, speaking then. So Eusebio, welcome. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh it's great to, to be here, and, and I just realized I was the first faculty to go into a virtual interview, and now the first one to do the hybrid enlightening lunch. So, so it's good to be first in something. <laughs> um, so it's, it's fantastic to be here. Um, what I would like to present is a piece that I'm working on. Um, so that is actually linking my main area of research that is digital innovation to issues related to uh, development goals specifically related to climate change. So let's see if I can move here. Next, hold on. Yeah. I click on the location here. Yeah. Let's see. Oh. Oh. Okay, we're good. So the first thing I want to acknowledge uh, this is a research in progress that I'm presenting. Uh, we're still in the conceptual phase. The idea here is also collect some ideas and suggestions. Um, in regards how to progress with this. Uh, I'm developing this with uh, Sonny Sunwar. Uh, he's a former colleague in Baltimore in entrepreneurship, but he's also a founder of Dynahex, which is a company that basically creates digital maps for uh, carbon footprint and, and energy consumption. He's been uh, strongly linked to the whole climate change entrepreneurship scene. So we are basically uh, putting forces together to look at how we can get sustainable entrepreneurship and digital entrepreneurship together. So as a general background, the, the motivation for, for, for developing this, the first one, of course, is looking at the ubiquity of digital ecosystems across the world, how pervasive the technologies are, are, are transforming, actually, how we do things, including how we develop entrepreneur ventures, right? So one of the things that's interesting, especially when you look at the literature, the literature in digital entrepreneurship uh, has spiked on the last three to four years in, in, in amazing levels. But interestingly, this is nothing new. There is areas called techno entrepreneurship, online entrepreneurship, e-entrepreneurship or electronic entrepreneurship that really looks at the same phenomena. How can you leverage the, the, the affordances or the, the capabilities of digital technologies in the development of new entrepreneurial ventures. We just published a, a, a book chapter in the handbook of uh, digital entrepreneurship that actually did a, a, a analysis, a longitudinal analysis of the literature. And actually we were mad, we managed to map how you know, the early, the mid nineties, early 2000 and the current literature actually built on each other. So in the mid nineties, this was called techno entrepreneurship. Uh, in the 2000s was called E because it was the time of everything. You know, it was like e-commerce, e-business, e-whatever. Then, and then on the last few years, especially around 2017, you see this boom on uh, digital uh, entrepreneurship. Well, the other motivation is uh, whether I believe it or not, is the issue of climate change. You know, today's what? Uh, 108, so it might, might be happening. But anyway, uh, the, the idea here is that, you know, in addition of thinking of new technologies that can help to mitigate 
uh, climate change and, 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 and support climate action. We also look into public policies, but specifically, we want to look how those two things can also relate to entrepreneurial action and how it can actually, you know, help mitigate or help uh, support the efforts that we have uh, in terms of reducing levels of global emissions. So one area now of entrepreneurship that looks into this is the idea of you know, sustainable entrepreneurship that basically looks at those ventures that aim either to address climate change or to support sustainable development ventures, right? And this literature has gained tremendous uh, traction on the last few years. But uh, as, <laughs> especially for the PhD students, uh, where is the gap, right? So one of the things I always tease about when there's a research gap, you have to be a bit cautious because maybe there's a re good reason why no one cared about it or either, you know, people didn't see or, you know, was, was not there or simply, you know, it's something that people are not interested. But I think in the case here is it's interesting that the sustainable entrepreneurship literature um, has grown quite rapidly, but you see very... Um, little efforts or, or, or in the production of actually connecting this idea of digital entrepreneurship and sustainable entrepreneurs. There is some work in that, but um, uh, I think there is a lot of room and there is you know, the calls actually for a research agenda uh, moving there. And I think this makes a lot of sense given that you see a shift, especially coming from the business literature, from performance gains to actually broader social ecological um, outcomes. So it makes just sense to see this kind of uh, um, literature, you know, uh, getting traction. But one of the big issues is that a lot of times the, this literature looks at um, technology as a black box, especially because most of the time it's written by non-technologists, right? And in, in a very few cases, you have actually those partnerships where you get a technologist teaming up with somebody on sustainable entrepreneurship. So one of the issues is that it normally focuses on the, what we call the materiality of the architect. What the heck is that? <laughs> well, it is basically focused on say blockchain or AI or, you know, or look at big data, but not really looking at the underlying properties of the ecosystem and the entire digital sphere that actually is driving the use of that technology. So uh, the other issue is that you see in the literature either approaching for a more uh, social or soci uh, sociological point of view and or from a technical perspective. And you hardly ever see this kind of integration between you know, technology and, 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 and society. So um, the lack of this social technical so here's an example of a model that's been uh, um, recent published and I shared the paper with the, with the PhD students. Um, if you see here, you know, we use that as a base, but the goal of this model is to illustrate how technologies are being used, right? And when you look at the array of technologies here, for example, the, the basic idea here is that you have uh, problems and or challenges, and then we'll talk a little bit more about, but I, we, we noticed that there are a number of overlap being issues around those identification of problems. Some of them are related exactly to the same phenomena and can be treated with the exactly same affordance of technology. And some others we felt it was a little bit of a laundry list. <laughs> um, and here comes you know, the core of our um, work that is, it, it looks at the relationship of technologies and what they call the digital toolbox, but basically looks at the applications of things like media, blockchain, big data, and doesn't really unpack that and look at why those technologies provide a solution to climate change uh, uh, challenges. Then this model looks into pathways that is basically, uh, you know, uh, the, not even the business model, but looking at types of services or things that could be done uh, in terms of the application of technology. And then it implies that uh, it helps to reach 
uh, sustainability objectives. Um, to me, I think it, th that idea is, is really good and it helped us a lot, but we felt there was strong shortcomings into that. So what we try to do, what we're trying to achieve through this research is actually unpack the real the digital black box and, and try to develop a more integrated social technical framework that aims to actually map potential development of entrepreneurial ventures in climate tech. So Jared there from the Center of Entrepreneurship, I hope I get a framework that somebody says, I want to do something climate tech. There you go, look at this. And they can, can, they can come up with a potential venture there, or at least be able to map and think and structure their idea. How do they identify a problem, turn into an opportunity and see how that opportunity generates an outcome. So that's what we're trying to do. Our goal also here is to make you know sustainability, entrepreneurship, and digital innovation people equally unhappy <laughs> because uh, I think that's one of the challenges of interdisciplinary research is that you know you you at the end of the day uh, you're touching different bodies of literature that may use different uh, words or keywords, but at the end of the day we think there is a very clear overlap of those areas. So let's talk a little bit on the development of the framework. So the first thing we look at what they call managerial problems, and we actually consider those are climate action voids. You know, it's basically at the end of the day, we look at knowing, evaluating to us is about understanding how my actions are reflecting in terms of how much carbon do I produce, how much energy I consume, right? And the second one is actually translating that into value. To us, is basically understanding, right? Valuating for us is an instance of actually knowing. Instead of knowing how much, you know, what is the actual dollars of that, you know, how, how simple is that? Then we look at communication, coordination, and trust, reach, and, and, and access. <laughs> That's engaging. At the end of the day, you're looking at different instances where information communication technologies are being used to generate a, a action and interaction among the actors. And then we still try to struggle why institutions were there. <laughs> as, as you know, understanding is a problem, but at the end of the day, the institutions actually, they are a result of knowing and, and, and engaging on the sense that the, what is defined so then we go to the core of our thinking. So the actual second piece there, there is the black box. So in order to be able to unpack the black box, we really need to stop thinking at individual pieces of technology and start to thinking about a digital ecosystem. That, so just for, uh, um, I'll do a quick um, review or an understanding what it, well, how is it different from so the first thing to think about is that you have a number of technologies, internet, wireless telecommunications, uh, you have a number of developments of innovation like miniaturization, convergency, fluidity. You have the issue of cost effectiveness that makes basically the creation of a fluid and pervasive ecosystem. For those that are old enough to remember Radio Shack, every single thing on the Radio Shack, it's here. Your VCR, your cassette player, your TV, your fax machine, your camera, it's actually here. So you see a number of technologies converging and actually creating this fluid ecosystem. One of the things that's interesting to understand is that it doesn't you know, come up in one, you know, robots not built in a day. You have three clear uh, stages of the development of this ecosystem. The first one was stationary, right? where Sarah here had to go to work, sit on a desk and get into her desktop. That was the only way that she could actually reply to an email, right? As you know, technology evolved, we got uh, modems and, <laughs> and we got internet kiosks. You can see here the, the maroon area growing and on the network stage, you had a number of devices, all stationary that allowed us to get a, a, a larger temporal and spatial reach of where the technologies were um, uh, present to support us. And on the third stage, that's where we are at this point, 
is the ubiquitous stage where basically it doesn't really matter where you are, when you are, do you have a pervasive? So if I need to send a message to Dave here, you get either on your watch, on your phone, on your tablet, on your TV, or on your, you know, there's a number of devices that do. But at the end of the day, what is the disruption here? It's not about information, but it's really about when, where, and you actually are able to interact and you have those tools to support your tasks. So essentially what I'm trying to say here is that a number of different technologies and a number of different innovations, there's with connectivity, portability, storage processing creates this ubiquitous ecosystem that basically does two things. It supports individuals into accomplishing tasks, whether the task is to see if my daughter got to school today or whether the task is to see what's the temperature uh, um, at four o'clock today. But also it, with the development of IoT or Internet of Things, it creates a, enhanced objects that become into a cyber physical layer. And so all this together, you see more and more embedded devices that creates this perpetual connectivity that really blurries the, the, the boundaries of human and machine interaction and also with the interaction with the environment. So if you think about, and this room right now, I think is a good example of it. You have time, space, right? You have actors here, you have artifacts, and we have this cyber physical reality that is interplaying. Hi, everyone on the other side of the screen. <laughs> and what is interesting is that, you know, um, I want to, I think it's a good idea to cite the police here. You know, every breath you make, every move you do. So what you're looking here is that all actions or number of actions or interactions, they become computed. So you have a paradigm shift from physical reality to digital reality, and then they converge into a cyber physical reality. And those affordances, especially because those actions become computed, they actually create a, a basic um, elements, the basic elements that allow us to really think of digital innovation. So if you think about the characteristics of technology here, they are, you know, they're cyber physical. They have a transmitter reality on this. That you have, for example, a ticket that is printed and you have a ticket on your watch to get into a plane, right? What you're seeing here, the, the form and, and, and the function are no longer constrained by each other. The second thing you see is that it's embedded. And, and by being embedded, you know, Katina is one that talks about embedding to the body, right? So you see more and more things, whether it's your light switch or whether it's your cup, you know, smart this, smart that, and you know, when suddenly we have like smart bodies. But the idea here is that you see this embeddedness coming. The other thing is important that this technology is connected, creating this network. And of course, because of the nature of digital, all actions, they become computed because at the end of the day, they come into a bunch of zeros and ones. So how does this translate to the potential creation of value? Or basically we pin down Three things. One is the issue of digitalization and decoupling, that function no longer constrained by form and actually captures on the computational nature. So for example, if uh, we are here, Cindy here is, is actually turning on the light of her room and that, that action computes into a certain consumption of energy that then turns into information. And that information can be fluid and then translated into your carbon footprint. The ubiquity and the embeddedness that's basically is everywhere with everyone in everything. Of course, there are you know, limits to this, but you have the idea of the pervasiveness. It's actually very hard to disconnect. <laughs> and the third one is the network, which probably is most important here, is how all those things get together. So it, 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 it creates, um, it connects all, all the actors and, and actions into the ecosystem that allows you to facilitate or to help the orchestration of resources. And at the same time, the, the, com the combinatorial complexity here allows an amazing level of innovation because you put together things, even to a cyber physical reality that you know, in the old world 
was not existent. So at the end of the day, we, we searched to, you know, to unpack the, the digital black box. The idea here was that we, we, we created a layered understanding of that. The first thing you need, you need an infrastructure, right? If you go so talk to people <laughs> at technology companies, they will talk about cloud analytics, AI, 5G. But at the end of the day, for some old school people, it's storage, processing, and transmission. <laughs> that allows you to have a layer of artifacts. And those artifacts, there are two types of them. One is what I call, in a paper that I published a couple of years ago, UMS, ubiquitous media systems. Those are media systems that allow humans and the ecosystem to interact. Whether it is your, um, I think, um, uh, bit Fitbit is actually just buzzing, or any screen, your Alexa speaker, any kind of media that allows the interaction between the human being and the ecosystem. And the other one is the IoT side that allows the uh, a layer, a digital layer to physical objects, such as a smart pen or something. So those two things together, they enable the existence of the digitalization of those core enablers that I just talked on the previous slide. But if you see here, those are the material artifacts. And those are the abstract artifacts that need to be also in place to be able to generate ventures that will tackle uh, uh, climate change. So they need to actually be aligned with the process and the features of the products that are actually being developed. And they need to support the business model there to be able to generate value. So a lot of times the literature just looks at the material artifacts without looking at the enablers that are they're emerging from the interaction of the actors with those artifacts and actually tying up to the development of the uh, abstract artifact. So basically what we did here, we'll look at the climate action voids informs the opportunity recognition of the entrepreneurs in this, this area. And basically they look at a number of material artifacts, which is basically the technology in terms of how digital and ubiquitous and networked it is. And then the interplay of the abstract artifacts, how it ties up to a process, how does it tie up to a business model? How does it capture value? allows us to enable the value proposition, which by nature of the network effect in the digitalization of the ecosystem is a highly scalable. Of course, they go into different segments, like for example, Dynahex that we're gonna talk about, they look into the B2B market. So they look at like ASU and create a map of ASU and understanding the, the, the energy consumption and carbon footprint of the university. A company that I worked with, um, in the UK and New Zealand, COGO is actually creating individual footprints, carbon footprints, by tracking your expenditure. So if you go to and have a coffee at Starbucks, they actually under, they actually can measure that expenditure, that coffee, you know, what's how that affect on your footprint. And the same thing they understand by the companies that are connected to the finances, they are translating that data into basically uh, carbon and and um, environmental impact. But when you look into the outcomes, is that the deployment, the use of those technology will facilitate the climate action outcomes, which we hope, and I think the entrepreneurs there hope to, is to, is to create social ecological impact, but at the same time, uh, support institutional changes. As people become more aware of their patterns and their consumption, they actually impact into the environment, they may push for different policies and so forth. And so there is an interesting relationship into that that ties up to the natural ecosystem, the social technical ecosystem and so forth. So that's what we came up with trying to unpack the, <laughs> the black box and try to relate it to the natural ecosystem and to the social technical ecosystem that is embedded. Just a quick case study to kind of show where thinking are going. We're using Dynahex, which is uh, Sunny's company here. And basically what they do, they, they, they monitor and create visualization maps for energy consumption. And that is converted basically into a decision support tool that allow their clients to uh, make better decisions in terms of 
you know, um, climate action and their financial returns. If you apply here to the model, basically they, they look at a problem that in you know, organizations, they, they struggle to identify uh, the different types of emissions by their sources. They, they struggle to set actionable uh, reduction pathways. Then that they looked at, at this need and they created this interaction of the material artifact and the abstract artifact that is basically a set of technologies that use geospatial data, they use consumption data, they use you know, uh, some algorithms that were developed that translate that into business processes or organizational process that guides the organization to take certain actions to mitigate their climate. So at the end of the day, um, they, are, they provide as a value to the clients or to the, to the organizations that are cities, that are uh, buying their product to immediately be able to measure how their actions or, or where to tackle to actually uh, maximize their um, um, effects into, the, into mitigating or uh, the, the, the impact into the environment. So the idea here, they, they, they look at, you know, as a product, decarbonization as a service. And as more you see that deployed, we all hope <laughs> that will lower, you know, the client's carbon footprint, who we'll also push for energy and, and consumption and construction and all sorts of different areas that policy can also help with factual data into this. So our next steps, just to make sure I'm on, right on time. We were lucky enough because we have an insider. <laughs> we identify 73 climate tech ventures and we are hoping to now uh, establish a connection with them. So we're basically trying to validate this framework, really understanding the mindset of the entrepreneurs there through a mixed method study. So maybe we start with a more grounded theory into this, kind of trying to see what emerges if our thinking and then compare to our initial framework. And then we hope that we, in terms of theory, we're able to develop a theory that, um, <laughs> that no longer focuses on specific technologies, but look at the broad affordances of the digital ecosystem and try to connect that in, into the, the, the mapping of opportunities to, uh, for entrepreneurial ventures. In practice, we hope to see you know, students in the <laughs> entrepreneurial center, I look at you, Jared, but, but I think of that, I can see, you know, they go in there and kind of put in the thinking in order to think about that. That's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see the more, you know, market-based solutions that are going to this, um, being able to, to, to show that interaction with the broader ecosystem. Of course, limitations on this, this is still at a very conceptual stage and, you know, and, and probably because of the, the kind of approach we do, it will be you know, limited to a sample, but it would be interesting to see if we can broaden it. So that's what I had of, you know, that's what I've been having fun when not yelling at my kids. I mean, I've been a single parent the last couple of weeks, so, uh, <laughs> but that's what we're doing now. And I think it's a very interesting opportunity here. Thank you. Questions? That's what's your, how are we handling questions? Um, I mean, I'm telling them to raise their hand. Okay, great. Uh, and then people are able to unmute themselves too. So. Huh? Uh, and I'll have, I was thinking that last time I did a presentation, it was on March 13, 2019. I mean, face to face, 2020. Was it to stop the recording? Um, yeah, she can start. Are we recording the QA? Um, we usually record for the first hour. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, Cindy and I are on Zoom too, so we can see if anybody raises their hand here. Uh, if anybody online has any any questions they would like to ask as well. Or feel free to use the chat if you're more capable and comfortable with that. <laughs> Yeah, question over here. So, Nobio, uh, the framework you presented in the black box, right? The material and the abstract artifacts. Uh, it sounds like that could be used for a lot of different digital ventures, entrepreneurship. 
types of situations, although entrepreneurs don't necessarily think in those terms. So what is it about your model that is really uh, linking it to the social climate? I mean, is it sort of the inputs and the outputs, or is there something about the model itself that's a little bit different than, say, doing a blockchain venture? Okay, so I think there are two elements. I, I like your question, and I, I agree that the essence of digital, right? And, and it was funny because just before here, I I had this meeting that I do weekly with my PhD students, right? And we're talking about, you know, and when you think about, um, there is a big difference between theorization and contextualization, right? And the issue here is that the idea of the interplay of digital affordances or digital capabilities, right? When you look at the actor, it didn't become affordance, right? But if you think about digital capabilities and that, to me, it's valid whether you try or we're trying to tackle climate change or you're trying to sell more soap, right? However, I think what becomes specific into this is that we look at the nature of addressing those problems that, that are basically by understanding our impact and be able to, um, to, to orchestrate resources through the network. For example, creating trust, creating um, um, awareness of the issue and so forth. So I, so there isn't a specific fit because we're looking at, you know, most of the action that you look into, especially in the, the climate arena or the companies that are developing that, they have a very strong, basically, you know, they're, they, at the end of the day, the, the service product or the value that they're proposing, they start with how can we understand this and how can we mobilize different resources, different actors into this. So it specifically would be that, you know, could be different to different contexts, right? But the, the, the relationship of the environment and then understanding that and how digital, because of the nature of the technology lends itself to that, I think is very specific, right? But especially the core of that, what we're doing is, is really unpacking the digital and applying to that. The good news is I can apply that. If that works, <laughs> we can apply to many other SDGs. We're looking specifically to climate. And of course, the input output has you know, specific outcomes and specific objectives here. If we were looking, for example, at poverty, or if we're looking at look at uh, you know, any of the SDGs, so you can plug an SDG here, look at the outcomes that you want, and try to understand the process in the middle. But specific into, into the climate action, I think the, the digital, you know, I, I would advocate, uh, lends itself quite well, has a good, you know, technology task fit because of the, uh, you know, informational and, and network or orchestrational nature of the of the problem and of the technology. So it's kind of, to me, is a really nice match. Thank you. I think it's a really good question, and I hope I can apply in different places. <laughs> Like uh, Ben online has a question. Sure. Yeah. Can I can I be heard? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, am I heard all right here? Yes. Okay. Thanks, uh, Eusebio. Thank you for this presentation. I I um I had kind of a a, a broad question and maybe somewhat of an objection. Um, which you know, forgive me and hope hope you'll entertain. Um. It, it struck me that statements like, uh, because of the nature of digital, everything becomes computed, um, seem to be somewhat um, a technological determinist um, and imputing some kind of implicit and intrinsic nature to some of these or all of these um, digital infrastructures and artifacts um, seems to elide the, the role of the social structures and, and the social relationships that surround and are concretized through these technologies. Um, and I'm curious, particularly um, it, to what degree it might be important to you um, or not in, in, this, in this theorization to um, incorporate a focus on, for instance, the, the business models and social structures that um, digital entrepreneurship, for instance, is, is embedded and articulated through. Um, I also am thinking of the, the diagram that you that you showed where on the bottom are, are enabling infrastructures and on top of that artifacts and at the top, um, towards the top were business models as though the business models naturally arise out of the, again, quote unquote, nature of the technical objects themselves and some kind of fixed affordance set um, rather than 
for instance, this being a reciprocal relationship where in fact, it's the business models and those social relations themselves that stabilize and, and guide the direction of these affordances as they appear and, and become concrete over time. And I'm thinking here, of course, of, of decades of STS research around the social construction of technology. And um, I'm curious about the role you feel that that kind of body of literature might play for this work. And um, yeah, in general, how you might respond to this idea, perhaps a, an objection here along the lines of calling technological determinism. Okay, um, thank you. I think it's a very good question. Well, the first thing is, when I say that everything is, you know, when you're dealing, when you have a digital technology in place into the ecosystem, the nature of it is that you have actions or elements that will be computed. Simple as that. It doesn't undermine and it doesn't uh, uh, decouple from the social structure. There's a couple good papers that you can look at. For example, there's a recent MISQ paper that looks at the, the interplay of digital innovation and social uh, institutions, right? You look at the interplay uh, of the, re the reverse of digital, of an, the ontological reversal when you're looking at digital, you know, uh, being deployed and how it's actually it, it interacting with a more broad uh, abstract, right? Play. So perhaps the, the way I, I presented it was not uh, clear, but definitely what we're trying to show here is that we focus on the interplay between the two of them, that one lends to each other. So for example, when a technology is designed, it's not designed on a vacuum. When the technology is deployed, it's not deployed on a vacuum. So that, that I don't think, you know, the technological determinism that comes into, to me, the idea of the usage that you're coming into this. But when you're saying that if those technologies are really deployed, the, the idea that every there is computational is a characteristic of the technology, simple as that. We're not saying that that, that makes the, the social um, um, and more abstract artifacts of that uh, irrelevant. And the other thing, I think on the model, we're not, you know, if you want to put, we can flip it and you can put left and right or whatever it is. The idea here that we're trying to show is that you need to have an interplay between the two. And that's what we're trying to convey. But I, I like your question in the sense that uh, perhaps the way we're presenting should convey in, in a, with, with more strength that idea that the focus here is on the interplay rather than on the simple nature of it. I, could I add just one, one quick follow-up to be very concrete yeah. about it? I, I wonder if for your model, it would make some kind of difference, for instance, if you were talking about um, a, a cooperatively owned venture versus a multinational corporation shareholder capitalism uh, or, or venture capital backed, right? I wonder if it would make any difference to your, for your theorization, depending on the ownership and agency distribution structure of the organization or institution responsible for the development and deployment of a given digital entrepreneurship because initiative. Because this is one of the, to me, uh, uh, an interesting debate that I see in the era of social entrepreneurship, right? What is social entrepreneurship? What is the boundaries of it? At the end of the day, so what you're looking here is if the organization, right, is, is, is generating profit, but at the same way is actually the, the outcomes that it's generating. For example, let's say you're looking at an organization that's pairing with banks to inform consumers about their um, environmental impact or is that, right? I think the nature of the venture comes into the actual mission of the organization and how that actually uh, twangles into the, the development of the, the, the purpose of it, right? But it, it's a very interesting debate in regarding, you know, what is social entrepreneurship and what is not? And I think that goes exactly to that. To me, what we're looking at here is to think about how can you identify the opportunities, right? And, and then act upon. Now, the design of the revenue model and how that will be structured, that's to me, you know, something else that comes more into then how it will be structured. But I believe that by the nature of the problem, it tends, it tends to lend itself to more 
how can I say, socially environmental conscious uh, entrepreneurs. But in some cases, it may not, right? And that's, at the end of the day, uh, uh, to me, a, a interesting point to look at um, in terms of the motivation, why people decide to do something about climate change and not do something about optimizing sales of soap. You know, nothing, I, I use soap on a daily basis, but, you know, I think there's different purpose there. But I think that enters really well the realm of what is social entrepreneurship or even those sustainable or environmental uh, entrepreneurship. It's, it's an interesting area. Yeah. It looks like Katina's unmuted, so that can be a question. Sure. So, uh, from my personal experience in studying entrepreneurship, you get different answers depending upon the stage of the companies Correct. that you're interviewing. And I guess what we're learning at HSD is it's as important to look at the failures as well as the successes. And so, I'm curious for your 73 companies and studied doing, what stage are you looking at? Are there any companies that are already established in the market selling a product, or are you also interested in? entrepreneurs who are looking for an opportunity but may or may not end up actually pursuing. So the sample that we managed to get, the majority of them are already operating, right? Or some of them are into, you know, second rounds and so forth, but they are, um, they already formed the venture, right? They're not on the pre. So we're trying to understand. So if you think about exactly that, if you think about the, the cycle or the development of venture, right? We're trying to kind of go retrospectively and trying to understand why and how and what the alignment of the, 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 let's say, the voids that exist and the technological affordances aligned with the, with the process and business models that they would do, we're trying to understand that thing, right? So, but... Primarily if they're successful. Well, we, we don't know. They, they might be, well, it depends. If they are like, you know, $5 million in debt, I don't call that success, right? They still afloat, but... At the end of the day, one of the things is, is very interesting, and, and I have a quite cynical view of this, that as much good they want to do, at the end of the day, they need to produce positive cash flow. The moment that after you know three, four rounds of angel investors, right, or whatever, how many rounds you have into you know hopes of unicorn, if the venture is not producing positive cash flow, I don't think the bank manager will be a good friend, right? The same, you're doing great for the world, but has what? You know, so, so, uh, but in, in this case, we have a little, you know, we have a, a bit of a variety and we're controlling for that, the maturity of the company, right? But they are, we're not, one of the things can be interesting and, um, and I like her is actually, once you finish this piece, the next piece is actually go to incubators or to go to, you know, accelerators to go into, um, you know, even though I have some, well, <laughs> I have some issues about those models, but anyway, but going to the, the you know, the, folk, the, the people who are actually saying, I want to do something, I want to be an entrepreneur, and I want to do something great for the world, right? Uh, um, um, and, and I think um, that will be an, an interesting follow step to see kind of, you know, to see the, the people, the reality of who did it. <laughs> and, and, you know, and of course, in this case, we will get some failures. One of the interesting things of looking at startups, and I've been doing over the years quite a lot of work, even though um, inquiry-based learning with my students, was actually look at problems that my students worked with, with those startups, and see the ones that actually, you know, died after a couple of years. I hope was not the, the advice for my students that made that, uh, but, uh, and look at ones that actually are still afloat or, or thriving. Right, and you can actually start to see, you know, but in general, you look at a high level of mortality, right? So it's interesting to try to mitigate that level of mortality. And I like the idea, I think you, you, you give me um, Project B. <laughs> so exactly, so I think it's interesting to look at the aspirational. There is a question from Katina that's up in the chat. Uh, oh yeah, uh, see how this might relate somehow to PIT. If so, how? Um, I think, Katina, thank you for the, 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 the question here. 
and just put one note here with the incubative uh, venture stage. Okay, so I think what you see here is that hopefully, <laughs> right, the types of ventures that will be created in this because of the nature that we're looking at here, which is climate change, uh, will be of public interest, right? That's what you 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 you, you would believe in. Um, one of the things can be interesting is the application of some of the elements of, of PIT and in, in, into the design of the venture, right? To look at, okay, you're doing this, but who you're including, you know, what is the, 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 the reach that you're doing this, how this is actually uh, generating outcomes to that. So I think it aligns well by the theme, but I think the devil's on the details, how the actual venture is being developed and what is the target market. Now I've seen things that looks really good, that you know they're doing great things for the environment, but the target market is a small portion of the population, especially people with high income, that they see like a bank sees value added by providing them an assessment of their carbon footprint, but that's only 20% of the market, while you still have 75% of the population in the country without any type of financial uh, inclusion. So I think that the theme lends itself, especially if you want, when you think about the network effect and you want to, to have the scalability of climate action going in all different levels of the public and all different publics. So I think that two things, they lend itself quite well. So we have a, a question um, a hand raised from online from Yasmin. Uh, if you can unmute. Yes, I'm here. All right. If you can. Yeah, great. Um, actually, my uh, question is about, um, so I have two questions actually, they embed to the subject. So one of them is about the scalability, like the scale of these um, sustainable enterprises or sustainable technological enterprises. So I have problem understanding that what kind of issues these um, incubators or uh, new technologies are trying to accomplish. For example, we can set up different purposes like waste management or air pollution or create a startup to, I don't know, reduce traffic or even it can be behavioral changes or many different things to add the social ecological value. Um, so my question is about the scalability, um, the level that these um, problems can be solved. Is it in a kind of a neighborhood? It can be a country or, or what? And the next question that is related to it is, could you please give us some of the successful examples or some of the um, actual existing startups or other ventures that are currently getting any results after um, the, the implication of the idea. Okay, so good. Uh, yes, me. so thank you for that. So, okay, your first one is scalability, right? One yeah. of the things that when you think about a, a venture that is from fundamentally informational by its nature, right? Um, and you have, and you assume that you have a high level of pervasiveness of access and reach of the ecosystem into that. It allows you to scale in different levels. Now, the question is whether you're, you know, you're looking, for example, at a company that looks into developing, um, it could be a city, like the city of Phoenix or the city of Tempe. And what you're looking is a, is a, is a to develop a, a venture that will basically be constrained by the geographical boundaries of that. But the geographical boundaries, that constraint is much more related to the purpose of the organization than actually the, the boundaries imposed by the digital ecosystem. On the other hand, you have the idea that you, like the company I showed an example here, Dynamhacks, they could have clients or different municipalities all across the, the United States and simply deploying that to any municipality that, con that consumes energy. It could be a townhouse complex. It could be a university 
right, as the client. So the, the scalability comes because of the cyber physical nature of the venture, it allows you to really transpass boundaries of uh, uh, geographical and temporal bond. Of course, there are regulation boundaries, there are, you know, goes in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you think about the fluidity of the, the, the venture, right? The examples I, I mentioned, well, Dynamax was one, uh, Kogo is another one that I think has been extremely successful. They grow quite a bit. Uh, what they're doing, they are basically creating a intelligence tool that allows uh, through tracking financial expenditure, understanding um, people's impact into the environment through their carbon footprint, but at the same time, uh, developing tools that allows them to align their uh, development, you know, sustainable development goals with their consumption. So for example, uh, we go here and Michelle here decided that she wants a coffee. Coffee shop on this side of the road, I can look at there and they're really, you know, good coffee. They're actually 50 cents cheaper, but I look at their ratings for fair um, uh, uh, wages and they are recycling, they are crappy, terrible. On the other hand, there is this other coffee that the ratings of the coffee is not that good, right? But it's eh, almost there. But their ratings into you know, their sustainability impact, uh, their wages and so forth is pretty high. So then now, Michelle, what do you do? Better taste, cheaper price, or better for the world? <laughs> Don't have to choose, right? But that, this, that's, that is basically a support tool that she will give the dollars to what she cares more and then decide where to buy. So to me, that's a very interesting. Uh, there are some people also developing um, nudging tools based on uh, persuasive and pervasive systems. We've done some work in per persuasive systems, uh, especially for training and so forth. So at the same time that you can have you know, the same techniques <laughs> for you to go and watch um, you know, uh, more videos on YouTube, uh, that, you know, or to nudge to buy another um, useless uh, piece of plastic from China in Amazon, you can use to actually uh, nudge or to stimulate if you want to do. Of course, there are big implications into that, right? But uh, you can also think about the development of that into uh, promoting, let's say, better uh, individuals. So you can look at different levels, right? You can look at a consumer level, you can look at a, you know, a B2C more level. You can look into a B2B2C. They can provide a, a third party to a, to a specific consumer a group like Coco is the example. Coco's clients really are banks, right? But at the end of the day, the end user are the bank's customers. And that's what's providing value to the bank customer saying, you know, my bank provides me this tool which allows me to, Michelle, to make better decisions or decisions that allows me to align my consumption patterns with my, you know, sustainable goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Dave? So, I, my question sort of lies in roughly the, the space that Dan and Christina, uh, the fair questions mapped out. It's a little still in toy, but let me try. Um, so far as I understand what's going on here, um, and you're, you're taking what is, you know, admittedly up front a very, um, you know, you're, there's an empirical look. You're looking at what is going on here. Yeah. But the way that you define what is going on here in part borrows um, in the way I've understood it from the actors in the sense that your frame and their frame is about how um, you call affordances attached to individual capabilities and the way uh, those individuals and other actors act within a given market context. Okay, so what the difference between capabilities and affordances is that capabilities is almost like you think about dormant affordance, right? Mm -hmm. Is the potential uh, exist and the affordance is the interaction mm -hmm. between the, the actor, the end user right. and the technology. Okay. okay, so what I'm wondering is, um, can you think about, well, okay, so we got that for a second. Let me tell a brief, very brief story. Okay. And then we'll 
one of the first presentations I ever saw on blockchain was basically somebody saying to me uh, in the group, well, you can have people interact um, who are distant from each other and don't necessarily trust each other. I'm not going to wait a minute. Do you really want to build a society where people interact without trust? Because what happens when some, you haven't built trust? You know, you're not telling me that you're building trust. You're telling me that people are interacting without building trust. So I'm wondering what goes on sort of, in essence, outside the frame that you've constructed. And is this a way, I mean, are there ways that what you've noticed about how digital tools can help you get to places that you want to go <laughs> within the frame in crudely of market interactions? Yeah. yeah. And, and in ways that Kat might describe as yeah. futures technology, yeah. what's, yeah. what's the outside of the frame? And I, and I love the question because to me, yeah. It's actually one of the reasons why I, 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 I moved jobs, to be very honest, <laughs> right? And, and it is, it is why I decided that I didn't want to be full-time in a business school. Mm -hmm. Because if you see the difference here, everything that I've done, you know, for a long time in my career had one purpose, optimization of performance, gains of efficiency. So I would go there and I would say to Michelle here, and would say, listen, if you use my app, Right, we will use nudging technology and all this. You're going to save 10% of your budget, right? Uh, of coffee expenditure. And she was like, "All right, I'm buying too much Starbucks these days." But that's it. That's that's my value proposition. Was optimization of performance. And what I think what is important here, we're looking at is hold on a second. If you see the example we just gave before, sorry, that, <laughs> but I like to use tangible outcomes here. Is actually we're looking much more broader on the outcomes of that expenditure. So I think the key, the key element here, that, and that's a big criticism that I have, that a lot of times the focus is rather than looking at the potential, the capabilities and potential affordances that the this ecosystem that is here, you know, um, can actually help us to build the future that we want to achieve the goals that we want as a society, how that it can actually help to leverage that. And I think that conversation is in many levels, uh, almost in existence in when you look at, you know, um, information systems, you know, now it's starting to have some, you know, some kind of, uh, we'll say, oh, oh, some awoke people that are not in that sense. But, I think the key element here that we're looking is that the, the, the you look at from the, the, the more, let's say rational business decision when somebody uh, buys the product from a company like Dynamics, for example, is saying, okay, I will save this much money into energy. And on top of that, I'll put a big, you know, green certification into my website that will drive more customers. So you can see tangible, um, you know, performance based to the organization. But what you're looking also here is okay, by seeking that, what they are achieving as broader outcomes. And I think it's that, you know, you're seeing a reduction in carbon footprint. You're seeing, for example, uh, you can look from the bank perspective for Kogo, for example, a B2C B2 type. You can see the bank saying, you know, I'm providing value added function to my customers. But at the end of the day, you're, you're actually the impact that you're generating. Our customers, they have better understanding of how their actions and their consumption affect the, the. So I think that's the beauty about it. And that's what I'm really excited about, being able to focus on things like this, that at the end of the day, if you see, I had very little performance optimization in it and much more the, the word outcomes in it. So thank you for your question. <laughs> Great, so why don't we um, all thank UCBO for...